about because they were weaving literally from one side of the circuit to the next. I know this has got nothing to do with rallying, whatever, but it's still a, it's a good story. Um, and uh, what's so fascinating is, and it, and it really goes to the heart of Porsche, they have some of the best engineers and mathematicians working for them. They always have had, they're very clever people. So they designed the 917 in, you know, with, with the science and physics and mathematics. So therefore, it could not be wrong. You know, if we cannot make mistakes with this, but it was horribly wrong. It was untriable. And then, as you know, um, Porsche handed the works cars over a year later to the JW Automotive team, and they painted them with Gulf colors, if you remember, the blue with the orange stripes. And John Wire, uh, who previously uh, been in charge of the Aston Martin teams and, and other great things, um, so that I can see exactly what's wrong with that damn car and why it won't handle. And I don't know what a hacksaw cost in 1970, but it's probably about one and six. And he got one of his chaps literally to saw the tail off one of these 917s with a one and six inch hacksaw, just hacked through it. And they built some fiberglass up on the back of the tail with a spoiler a la GT40, you know, from the year before. And suddenly the damn thing handled properly. And the Porsche engineer said, this cannot be so because we have done our homework properly and all you've done is taken a bloody hacksaw and put it all, you know, and it, and it, and it really did work. And it, of course, 1970 was the first year that Porsche won the Le Mans 24-hour car race, finally. And here, you know, the excruciating investment that that, invested, that, 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 that represented uh, yeah, it was exonerated for, for having done it because it really started selling cars in a big, big way for Porsche, who at the time were also winning almost all the international rallies with people like Bjorn Valdegaard uh, as number one and two driver. Vic Elford was there, of course, Lars Helmer and all those people. And the, the 911 was just absolutely a wonderful car. So 1970 was a good season for Porsche. They'd won everything almost every, every formula that you care to mention. 1969, however, was also the year they launched the mid-engine 914, the VW Porsche, as it was called in, in Europe, or the Porsche 914 in America. And uh, most people regarded it as, you know, as ugly as every family's maiden aunt. You know, every family in the world's got one of those maiden aunts with a wart on its nose. And, and here was the, the, the Porsche equivalent. And in fact, when Dennis Jenkinson came to, was offered a chance to test one, he refused to get in it because he thought it was so ugly. And he thought it, you, know, you couldn't tell whether it was going forwards or backwards. And they couldn't sell them either in America or uh, in, in this country or, or in Europe. You know, the, in terms of, of Porsche sales, it was really, really quite bad. So Porsche decided that they would build a team of cars to go rallying. 1971, and Bjorn uh, Valdegaard tested them and declared them to be rubbish, basically, even with the two-liter 911 six-cylinder engine in. And I think Porsche by that time had got it up to about 170 brake horsepower, so it, was, it wasn't slow. And the problem for Valdegaard was that, unlike the 911, which of course is rear-engined, um, the 914 being mid-engined, you couldn't you couldn't flick through the corners. You know, it was the the, the polar uh, moment of inertia was too low. You couldn't hang the uh, the tail end out at will as you could with a 911, and you couldn't change direction quickly enough because with a rear engine 911 with that pendulum effect, you're going too fast, flick it out, and it goes straight away, and it's, it's very very controllable, which you couldn't do with a 914. And Valdegaard and everybody else said, these cars are hopeless. You're going to have the worst season ever if you run them. Porsche refused to listen. And they ran the, the 914s. And they were absolutely hopeless. They, they scuppered on the, on the Monte Carlo rally. They were completely and utterly useless. Having said that, a 9146 finished sixth at Le Mans in 1970. So it wasn't altogether completely and utterly useless. It just wasn't a car that was suited to the rough and tumble of um, of rallying. So 1971, Porsche packed it up, and that was it. And then the big row came at Porsche, as I'm sure you all know, when things between Butzi Porsche and Ferdinand Pierre came to a head. And the old man, Perry, thought there's only one thing to do in this situation, 
And as any decent father would do, he kicked both of them out of the company and told them to sod off. And that was that. And Ferry Porsche made a rule within Porsche, the company that no member of the Pierre family or the Porsche family could become uh, a member of the board of directors, except himself, of course. And that, that was quite important. And um, so Putsi Porsche went off to start his own company called Porsche Design. And um, started designing useful things like sunglasses and tobacco pipes and all sorts of things like that. And has had a degree of success. And I was walking past a cigar shop two hours ago down the road here. And I know you can buy a Porsche tube to put your, Porsche, uh, put your Havana cigar in. I mean, I can't imagine why anybody would want one, but you know, they're probably 100 quid if you do, gentlemen, or perhaps a few ladies that would like a big Porsche tube. And uh, so, so Putsi started his own company, had a degree of success. He'd finished his 9-11 and had all the prizes and accolades awarded to him and was very, very happy with it all. Whereas Ferdinand Pierre went off sulk. And um, he eventually found his way into Volkswagen, picked that company up, brought Audi in, which was floundering and really quite nowhere, even by 1980 or so. And uh, by 1980, I thought to himself, well, the Porsche 911 really was quite a fantastic rally car, but I can do better than that. So they invented the Audi Quattro, which from 1981 to when 87, I suppose, became the car to beat on the international uh, rallying circuit. Um, and I can remember being at Sutton Park in the Midlands in 1983. I hadn't seen an Audi Quattro rallying at that time first time it was ever. And we were all standing on the side of the track, and I could hear this thing popping and banging in the distance, you know, as the turbo wastegates going in and out and all the rest of it. And I suddenly saw Michelle Mouton appear over a brow, <coughs> and she was destined to do another 300 yards before doing a 90 left into a corner. And I thought to myself, there's going to be the biggest accident since Le Mans 1955. People are going to get killed because no car can go into a corner at that speed. How wrong I was. She just shoved it down a gear and the car turned left and that was that. And on she went. I mean, a fantastic driver and Ari Vatanen and such people were just the same. And of course, all the other companies had to follow suit. This was the end of two-wheel driving rallying for a while. Peugeot, Ford, DL with the Metro 6R4, which was late as usual, but a fabulous car when it did arrive. They all came into Group B. And we saw rallying like, like we'd never even expected it. I mean, I don't know whether any of you saw the Group B rally cars, but they were insane. Do you agree? And, and I remember uh, when Walter Rohl drove the short wheelbase Audi Quattro Sport, um, he said that if you didn't feel what that car was going to do in advance, it would be the last time you felt anything at all. And there's a fantastic video that you can put bought in those days, I guess you probably still can, where there's a camera that's actually in the footwell where Walter Rohl is driving this thing. And all you can see throughout the whole rally stage is feet doing this. It just doesn't stop. I mean, it's just not human, is it? We don't drive cars like that. It's just absolute insanity. And um, so that was the Audi Quattro rally program that was but it, sorry, Ferdinand Pierre's attempt at really showing Butsy that he was better. And just before I forget, it's come forward to the modern day. If you go to Porsche today and you want a personalized version of the GT3, go to Visar, they'll measure you up for it. You can have gold plated this, that, and the other, and you pay 1.4 million pounds for it or whatever you want. The Bugatti Veyron, by contrast, costs Volkswagen 5 million pounds to make each one, and they retail at 900 thousand in this country. So the idea, and, and this is still the cousins still fighting with each other all these years later. This is, this is Ferdinand Pierre saying, don't go.